Hey guys, welcome to today's game plan. I'm just deciding which ball I want to hurl at the camera at the end of the show, but welcome to the game plan. We're going to get into some awesome action today, guys, as we look at what the markets have done. Now, the key about the markets right now is we finally saw the key breakdown on that channel on the S&P 500. So let's jump over and take a look, and we'll talk about jobless claims numbers in just one minute. But remember this channel, this channel going back to mid-November, very, very tight range on the markets, this slow incline. Interestingly enough, I want to show you guys this. I don't think I pointed this out to you guys, but you had actually a little bit of a head and shoulder right here, and it finally broke. It was also a break of this trend. But again, notice your this is your shoulder, your head, and your shoulder over here, and this is your neckline right there. Now, what's kind of cool about this is that if we want to think about where the target on this could be, right, where is this going to ultimately go, we can do a measured move of this, all right? How do we do that? Well, let's take a look. And this is how I, by the way, this is exactly how I calculated the target on oil, which, by the way, just as of yesterday, kissed that head and shoulders calculated target. So you have proof in the pudding, essentially, that these type of things do work. And I want to be clear, head and shoulders, honestly, they only work out about maybe 60% of the time. They're not super high reward, but what's nice about a head and shoulders pattern is that you know very quickly when it fails. So for instance, if the S&P rallies up today and we close back up above that neckline on a daily basis, it's off the table. You basically say, screw that whole pattern. It means literally nothing to me at that point, all right? Now in terms of calculations, all we have to do here is we just want to take a range, basically take the highest point of the head. So we're going to do this, right? We're basically taking this point here, dropping a plumb line down to here. That distance then gets replicated from the break point right there. All right, so again, let's do that live. I'm going to do that right now with you guys so that we can analyze where the target could be. So what we're going to do again is we take that highest point, we drop that plumb line down, and so the completion of this head and shoulders from this break point would be a $5 and approximately 62 cent drop. So what we can do is we just go over to the break point right over there, drop that down, $5.62 or as close as we can get right here, right? So right there, and your target is 450 on the SPY. Now what I love to do here is look and say, okay, well, if that's your target, right, where is that in conjunction with support and resistance? And if it, can, if it has a conjunction, meaning that there's a separate level there on a technical basis, that, <clears throat> excuse me, then you have something to actually show. And there is a little bit of a confluence there, right? If we take a trend line right here and we stretch it over to that price point, we very accurately can see, and again, let me move out of the way for you guys, that basically we're right in this zone right here and then that will coincide with that. It's also the 450 even number, which we know even numbers tend to have some sort of um, kind of power to them. There's a psychological factor that plays into even numbers. It's one of the reasons why I think, you know, when you get gold up to, you know, its highs right here around 2000, there's a psychological, oh my goodness, it seems so expensive, it's hard for it to break through. Once it do, does, it'll probably go almost straight to 2500. And yes, we are above 2000, but we're still kind of in that range. We really have to take out that triple top uh, inverse head and shoulders neckline. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Okay, so that's what we have going on here. Now, a couple other things we want to look at. So we looked at, and you guys know, we talked about the 10-year yield, right? And this is the 10-year yield, how it was coming into technical support. We have the trend line sloping up. We have this level here. Yesterday, we had a big sell-off on the 10-year yield. What ended up happening? Well, today, we're starting to get a bounce. Now, we didn't hit my exact level. That's a little concerning to me. It means there might be a little bit more downside, potentially tomorrow on the jobs data. But for the most part, we're essentially at that level, approximately at that level. You can see the drop that we've seen. So the 10-year yield is up today. Now, yesterday, we saw the 10-year yield dropping, and the markets fell off a cliff. And I want to talk a little bit about this, guys. In fact, let's flip back to the S&P here. I want to go to the daily chart of the S&P. Let me just erase these measured moves here as well, because again, it does cloud the chart. 
But basically what I want to just talk about here, guys, is that we have a chart on the S&P or the spiders that there's your channel, by the way. So there's your channel, there's your breakpoint that basically now has, again, the power of the bears. So the bears, remember a couple, and this is going back, and I know, you know if you're new to this show, you may not understand, but if you follow it daily, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And basically what we recall is that when we were trading around this level here, we had a gap up and reversal day. And I said, listen, the bears are trying to grab control of this market. The next day we sold off and then we rallied back and closed green. I said, guys, bulls regained control here. They just did. That was just the nature of it. Then we went sideways for a bunch of days. Yesterday we had a gap up, and this is the kicker. The gap up yesterday was on good ADP private sector numbers. And when I say good, I actually mean bad. And you might say, well, what the heck is Gareth talking about here? Good is bad. Well, basically for the markets, the markets want poor economic data. That's what we've been rallying on. Because the poorer the economic data, the more it takes the Fed from hiking out of play and the more they can potentially lower rates, right? And the market again, and I've said this before, guys, I mean, basically it's a drug-addicted investing public. That's what the markets are. They, are. they are an individual or entity that is so addicted to quantitative policy, to easing and printing of money and debt. I mean, heck, the consumer's more and over a trillion dollars in debt. I mean, this is just over and over and over again. Everything is about inject me with more liquidity, inject me with more money. That's what makes this market go up. And so what essentially this does is it creates this psychological need or want, like a drug addict, for the markets to get bad economic news so that they can rally higher. And that is what's been driving us up. Think about this, guys. Think about the S&P 500 on a monthly basis. In fact, I'm going to flip over to the SPX here. We're going to flip over to the monthly here. So let's do that right now. If we go to the monthly basis, right, this is your monthly chart of the S&P 500. Now here again, let me go over this. This was your pivot top in the dot-com era. This was your pivot top in 2007. And this is the run that has been debt and money printing fuel. I mean, look at this. Look at that vertical move. Like, it's literally insane. It's freaking ridiculous. And if you look at this, where was the national debt over here, right? It was literally a few trillion dollars. Where is the national debt right over here? We're approaching 30 four trillion dollars. Think about the credit card debt. Think about the loans. Think about the housing mortgage, you know, how much people owe on their homes. Now again, interest rates are a lot higher now than they were just a couple years ago, but still, my purpose, my point is, is that we're now at a point where we literally are addicted beyond belief to debt, and it has a fuel. This is a debt-ridden or driven market. It just is, guys. I mean, like legit. Ha, huh, look at that. <laughs> Bounced right back to me. But the point is, again, it's literally driven by debt. So you have to understand that at some point this has to unwind. At some point, people will realize you're not getting paid back. Like one of the craziest things, and sorry to get off on a freaking tangent here, but one of the most insane things, if you look at AFRM, and by the way, nothing wrong with this company. I mean, it's fine, but it's a buy now, pay later company, right? Well, we had Black Friday sales. And, they, and there was a 50% jump in people buying now and, and paying later. That's what we saw. So what does this stock do? It rips to the upside, right? They had good earnings. Everything's going swell. Well, of course it's going swell right now because they're making a ton of sales of people that are getting TVs, getting different things, and they don't have to pay for the next six months or the next year. What's going to happen when we slip into a recession and we actually have to see these people pay? They're not going to pay. This company literally, again, I don't know, like, listen, you know, should it survive? Yes, I think there's always a niche for that. But my point is, again, <coughs> is that it's buy now, pay later is not a good sign when you see a 50% jump in people doing that. It's just not, okay? So this basically puts us in a, a situation where if we go back to the S&P 500 here and we look at this, we see, again, this is yesterday, or this is, again, yep, this is yesterday. <coughs> I apologize, man. I'm getting too worked up over this stuff. It's just too insane. But we basically have a scenario where the bears have wrestled control. And my whole idea of talking to you about this was that yesterday was the first time, the first time that I saw 
bad news initially gapped the market up, which is normal, and the market actually sold off. It's almost as if institutional smart money is starting to say, holy cow, we are now going towards a recession. We'll find out, right? All right, we'll find out. All right, so anyways, my point is this. The bears have grasped a straw of control. Today is going to be a big day. Let's find out what the markets are doing. We did get jobless claims out just a little while ago. They basically came in line. I think it was about 219,000 for jobless claims. Let's go to the intraday spiders chart and let's find out where we are trading on the back of this data. Let me show my after hours pre-market data. And it looks to me like the markets are floating up a little bit. So look at this. Now what's interesting about this, and, and this just brings me off into even more cool stuff, is that if we extend this line out, that's gonna now be resistance, right? So if we rally up on the spiders, guess what? That's now resistance. And remember what I said, if we can get back above, then the bulls take control back again today. If we stay here or below, the bears continue to have control. All right, let's move over here, guys, really quick. So again, I just want to quickly go down here and just take a look again. And, and I'm scrolling down on this. I just want to see again those jobless claims numbers. So yeah, jobless claims rise to, to 220,000 in the week of December from 2019,000. So basically 220,000 jobs. Not a big event there um, for the most part. All right, let's get into some other stuff. And by the way, a couple other things to talk about. We're going to get into Bitcoin really quickly here. But I just want to point this out. Yesterday after hours, AMD unveiled its new uh, AI chip that's basically going to rival NVIDIA. Now, what have I been saying in these game plans? I've been saying to you guys that essentially NVIDIA is probably at a top or near a top when it was at 500 because it's just like Tesla in 2021. Remember, I like literally said these exact words. I said, listen, in 2021... Tesla was the best electric car out there, the only really player in town, and now there's a million people coming for Tesla's lunch because the margins were there. And what's happened? Those margins started to shrink because they had to cut their prices, right? And so essentially the same thing is going to happen to NVIDIA. NVIDIA was the only game in town for the last 6, 12 months. Earnings were knock your socks off amazing. But what do we know? We know that every other company is like, wow, look at the margins on those. I mean, they have like a 75% margin. Holy cow, let's build the same types of chips. That's going to continue to happen. AMD just unveiled it. Before you know it, there's going to be a ton of competition for these AI chips. And you know what's going to happen to price? What happens when there's a ton of competition when price with, with, with AI chips? Price is going to come down. And that's what's going to happen. So again, NVIDIA is a great company, but eventually other companies will start doing exactly what, what NVIDIA does. Now you could say, oh, well, they'll just keep innovating and so forth. Yeah, but innovations will slow down, right? The big jump was initially AI chips, and then it'll be like AI plus, AI a little better, AI a little better, and it's going to slow down in terms of that advancement. Okay, taking a look here. By the way, C3 AI reported earnings, stock's getting crushed. Also on that announcement with AMD, Microsoft is down as well because again, any, anyone that's a competitor on these AI chips is going to be hurt by AMD coming into the space with their chips. Okay, um, here we have Bitcoin. Bitcoin continues to pull back slightly after this move. This is very normalized trading. I want to be clear about that. This is nothing unusual. When you have a big move to the upside like this, this is what is actually healthy for Bitcoin to do. You get consolidation. So in fact, if you're a Bitcoin bull, you actually like this price action. This is a healthy thing. This is the marathon runner completing the marathon. Now they're taking a little time to relax so that they can rejuvenate and gain their energy so that they can make that next move up. Okay, now what would happen here if we change this pattern? And this is something as a technician I have to always watch out for. I always have to be aware of the pattern formation currently. Yesterday doesn't matter what's today showing us. So basically what I have to keep an eye on is the angle. And the angle's important. A bull flag is a right angle, right? That's a right angle. That's a perfect bull flag. An in spirit of flag pattern is a right angle, but then when you start to slope down, that's where it becomes an in spirit of. So essentially, when this is something I teach in my courses, is that when you're looking for bull flags, 
right? So this gives you your highest percentage of success, probability-wise. As the angle decreases from 90 to 80 to 70 to 60 to 50, et cetera, probability slowly decline. So if, for instance, we get in a situation where Bitcoin has a big sell-off and goes like this, then that takes away from that bullish pattern. It's no longer an in-spirit of bull flag or bull flag. It now becomes something else. So really, as a bull, you want it to maintain something like 90 degrees to about 45 degrees. Anything in here, this is fine. You don't want it to get more steep than that because that's where probabilities begin to diminish. Okay, so that as a technician, I will be watching on a daily basis. Flipping over to gold real quick here, guys. Gold is getting a little bit of a bounce here. Again, for me, I still think there could be a little bit more downside on gold to pull back, but I want to be clear. Gold, to me, continues to be a bull case that everything I'm seeing in the chart is telling me eventually this thing's going to bust out and rip higher, and ultimately, I think it's going to 2500 next year. But right now, if you're looking for where it's going to find support, simply put here, and let me zoom in on this so we can kind of get the best view possible. All right, so here, basically what you're looking at is max downside would be here and here. These would be your two zones where if price comes in, you want it to hold. You would not want it to break 1950. That would hurt the bull case. As long as it holds anything in here or even starts to move up here, that's more than perfect in the chart. All right, silver. Silver's an interesting play here. Silver is actually hitting a key or kissing a key pivot point. Notice the channel. We had the breakout. You've retraced to what I call the scene of the crime or very close to it. Silver is now very, very close, if not at a buying opportunity right in that level there. All right, so silver actually looks pretty good here. All right, next up, let's take a look at the next chart. Oil. Oil I talked about, guys, and again, if you do your measured move, this is the beauty of it. This is that head and shoulders I was referring to earlier, where again, if you just take your measured move from this high, drop a plumb line down to there, and you take it from that break point and you drop it down, basically it gives you this area right here. I was thinking it would get down to about $68.50, got down to about $69. Either way, you're essentially at your target or you could go just a tiny bit lower, but I think you start favoring a bounce on oil at this point in time. Just a bounce. Please understand, I'm not saying it's going back to 100. Very short-term move. Now let's talk about one of my horrendous calls here, natural gas. Natural gas continues to kick my butt. I'm glad to see it's bouncing here um, in the pre-market off of its lows. But natural gas, again, you know, this is one that's just continued to come down. I'm hoping we can form a bottoming tail today. Bottoming tail would be a reversal signal. The other thing, too, that has me, again, and, and this, is, this is the tough thing about natural gas, is like, you know, every day it seems like it's hitting another technical level. But one of the things I do want to show you is this line right here. All right, so we can see very clearly on that gas, all right, right here through here, through here, through here, through here, and we just hit that level in the overnight right there. So again, it's down like 33, 35% off of its highs and almost in a straight line. It is due for a bounce. This is where dollar cost averaging means everything to me. So again, when I've inched into, I play, by the way, I play the UNG. Uh, it's an ETF that tracks the, the, the natural gas money uh, or the natural gas price. But again, ask any of my members, what do I do? I start with a 1% position, at wherever I start, let's say I started right up here, add another 1% here, add a 2% here, and you dollar cost average in. I do that on all my trades, you know why? Because I realize I can be wrong and it's all about protecting capital. One of the best lessons you'll ever learn in trading. All right, guys, again, interesting stuff in this market. Let me flip it back to center screen here. Um, I'm going to get going because I got to get back to the trading floor. But again, markets are looking green today. But the question is, can the bulls regain control after that sell-off yesterday? Can we see us recapture that channel by the end of today? That's what you're going to be looking for there. I also want to see if we, if we want to see the bears really get control. Now, so the bears have slight control. Let's be clear. They, there's no confirmation of, a, of the move yet. Yesterday was a reversal day. You haven't confirmed it. If the bears, if we get another decent sell day today, then it's confirmed the probabilities of further downside increase exponentially. Again, if we get back above that channel, then again, it becomes more back in the bull case and we can continue to go higher. This is the life of a trader, guys, literally. Like I look at these things on a daily basis. The data in, I make sense of it in my head. I look at probabilities and data. That's what it's all about. Thank you so much for tuning in. Which one am I gonna do? Let's do both. We'll do one here and then one here. Take care, guys. Do you have an existing IRA or retirement account? 
iTrust allows you to buy and sell crypto, gold, and silver all right within your IRA. And the best part is they make it simple. All you have to do is transfer your preferable amount of USD through iTrust and then invest that into crypto or precious metals on the platform. To get access, use the link below to find out more about investing through iTrust Capital.